Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. A collection of quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective. And um, embedded within this collection of quotes, uh, we have a topic which we're currently in the midst of discussing the manic defense known as greed. So we're talking about greed. And I just, um, my video just cut out in part one. So this is, I just want to smoothly transition into this part two as a continuation of where I got cut off uh, due to storage limitations on my camera. So I won't do any kind of introduction to it here. Uh, it's available in part one, but I'd like to re recommend um, the past five videos. Um, part one of this one and the, and the four videos prior to it. They're all on the topic of greed. Um, the manic defense in general, that's 2476 to 77. And um, so let's, let's just continue with our thread on greed. So this is when, um, so greed is the repetition compulsion of replaying a disappointment in the nursery in the present with the unconscious fantasy that something in the present that a person obtains can be the needed breast from the past. Okay, so it's a secondary delusion, or someone said it's the psychotic part of the mind uh, u utilizing the non-psychotic or the normal part of the mind to fulfill this painful memory that as a baby they weren't held properly, seen properly, nursed properly, so they're trying to still get that need met. Okay, if the baby's trauma, when there's trauma, we repeat. So greed is the repetition compulsion of... Um, trying to undo the past, get a better past. Okay, so again, part one, we talked about this. A major, so let, let's just uh, continue here. Um, okay, uh, emotional eating. The greed of emotional eating is a state that attempts to uh, eliminate the potential for traumatic rupture in human relatedness by replacing relationship uh, with food. So the baby wanted a quality relationship with his mother. Uh, in the repetition compulsion, you know, food and the baby often associates food with mother. So uh, they're gonna replay the needed love with the mother, the reverie with the mother. Food, uh, food reminds the person of mother. So there may be a quality of trying to get the needed sweetness and love through the candies and the sweets with the fantasy that the candy can be, or the cookie can be the good experience for the past. Again, repetition compulsion. A solution that is largely self-contained and thus not subject to the betrayal of the other. So there's sort of a secondary gain. The cookies are always there. Um, that can fuel the repetition compulsion. So the baby needed the original sweetness with his mother. The safety, the warmth, the, the nerve endings, in the breast link in with the nerves into the child that helps the mother to be attuned and have reverie for the child to see the child and think for the child and be there for them be present for the child the bottle doesn't do that you know? so that's that's missing that's a trauma when there's trauma we replay repeat symbolically in the present we re, we the present becomes like a staging or an attempt to replay the past to get a better past so the cookie can stand in for mother um, it doesn't work. Um, the, the trauma, the traumatic memory, is still there. Uh, so it, it's unfinished business. There's this drive for healing, the pain of the memory. Do it again. They're gonna spin it again. Get another cookie. That cookie didn't work. Well, try it now. While they're gobbling up all these cookies, um, the brain, the cookie tricks the brain to send the person serotonin. So they're getting a kind of seductive secondary benefit by the cookies. Now the serotonin is not from the memory of having been loved. So if the baby's loved by the mother, um, the baby's brain is malleable, uh, 400 grams to 1,000 grams in the first year. And the brain is laying down the neural networking based on the interaction and the reverie with the mother. So if that becomes part of the child's circuitry, he has that within his wiring. He can soothe himself now. What the mother did for the baby, it's now in him and he can do it for himself. So if that's failed, um, they want to still get that. So they're hoping that the cookie can take them back in a time machine 
and be the good breast and offer the safety and the sweetness and the reverie to get the wiring that was needed. It doesn't work. No. It's called infinite mourning because the child doesn't understand time. It's timeless, no time. So he's doing it again and again because it's always now and he's always in unconscious pain by that memory. And it's, uh, so that's why. Not, and no cookie can be the good breast. No, no greedy item, no material, no money, no... So we're talking about greed, right? Something you don't need. Um, like beyond your basic needs. Um, so yeah, he says here, the cookies don't betray you. So maybe you take a kind of a... There's a real temptation to try again and again. Look, the cookies are always reliable. Well, the breast wasn't reliable, but the cookies are reliable. So, so again, repetition, um, greed is the repetition compulsion of the failed breastfeeding experience. Okay, so the greed can take place with food, it can take place with shopping, it can take place with plundering, the plunder system. Um, okay, this one's a question mark here. Um, I'm not even sure who Rose is, but she says, Rose's work clearly, okay, Rose's work clearly demonstrates um, what the bodies uh, of her clients display constantly. The exhibition of their infantile selves and infantile needs. Greed, here the result of unresolved pre longing. Okay, so greed okay, is the result of unresolved, unfinished business, okay, breastfeeding, longing, okay, has gone out of their control and has trapped them in obesity. So this emotional eating, it doesn't necessarily mean obesity, but it can be, right? So a good book on this is called Trink Yourself by um, meaning Analyze Yourself, uh, by Roger Gould. We, we have an earlier quote about uh, the overweight guy. He had the belly. Marion Woodman gave him an interpretation. He said, well, you didn't get the love from your mother, and now your mother passed away, and you panicked, and you gave yourself this big beer belly. Um, you're using that belly to, as a symbol for your mother. She said, quote, you're carrying your mother around with you everywhere you go. At the same time, um, it's a defense against admitting the loss because you, don't, you didn't get the love that was needed to be able to mourn losses. So you're still holding on to the mother because you can't accept the loss. So the obesity was a defense against mourning. So it's like a teddy bear, you couldn't let go kind of thing. So Mary Woodman is sort of a specialist in this area, linking psych psychoanalysis with emotional eating. Okay, next one here. Uh, somebody named Minsky goes on to analyze decolonization from a psychoanalytic point of view by looking at the projective mechanisms used by the enviers toward the envied. So the envied, they're seen as having something good. The enviers, okay, traumatized at birth, enraged, they become the enviers, they can't accept good, goodness. Seeing goodness is bothersome because it reminds them that they can't accept goodness. Goodness is too enraging for them. Hence, to not be triggered, okay, um, they use greed to dis as, a, as a destructive thing. Yeah. So greed is hatred of the good. They see goodness, they want to see it damaged. How do you damage? Well, tap into their unmet needs for greed, but they don't care about the greed. Greed is just a cloak for the envy. Now, the greed, of course, gives them some little hits of serotonin, so they become addicted to greed. But the real motive is the envy. So the, we see that with the plunder system. And, um, and we played uh, Kristen Wilson's speech um, in, the, the, in the first four videos. So by the way, this is uh, part five of, five of six, pardon me. This video is uh, 
part of five of six videos on greed. Uh, so many of the main quotes on the topic of greed, uh, can I ask somebody go back um, and read the quotes? If you just click the more link, you'll see all of the quotes posted below. I think it's well worth reading those quotes on greed uh, to bring us up to, to be brought up to speed to this point here. I, I can't really summarize the past uh, four videos. Um, so I'm just, I just want to add to, to uh, what we have here for, for this video here. The next one. She seemed to defend against her own intense oral neediness by projecting it onto the child as she again and again described the child as being so greedy and never satisfied. So that's, that's a very shaming experience. The mother uh, can't admit her, her uh, greed. So she projects it onto the baby. Look how greedy the baby is. The baby's enraged by this. No quality. So the baby wants quantity. You see, I told you, the baby's never satisfied. So she created it. So she traumatized the baby. And now the baby is enraged. Now has greed. When in the beginning, the baby didn't have it. The baby just wanted the normal sweetness with the mother. But the mother started off not having that. So the mother doing this might be reenacting what happened to her, you see. So in trauma, the mother may reenact what happened to her by doing it to her child to see what her mother did to her. It's called reenactment in an attempt to make it conscious. In seeing herself in him, she saw nothing but her own greed. And so the mother seeing herself and the baby, she just, she saw what was in him. So projection is the means of bringing repressed material to consciousness. The negative things, the negative things she was saying about the baby, that's like a mirror to see that it's within. So projection is like a mirror to see what's within. His greed for knowledge, the internal and external wellsprings of his scientific imagination that became theory in the making. So here's sort of a sublimation of the greed. So this one guy would read everything. Oh yeah, Admission. There's a, a film called Admission with the famous comedic actress Tina Fey, I remember. And um, there's a scene in there. It's like a high school kind of story. And the guy was always reading books, voraciously reading the books. It was like he was greedy. He's like gobbling in all the books and reading everything. So that's like a positive sublimation. So he became a scientist and all that. So that's sort of... That's sort of like a healthy... Sublimation is you're dysfunctional, but you're doing something that's, that's not hurting others. It's going to help others. So he channeled it in some way. Okay. So uh, this, there was one famous scientist here. His greed for knowledge, uh, be, uh, the internal and external wellsprings of his scientific imagination that, that became theory in the making. So while he was greedy reading everything, he started to come up with these little theories about things. So it was, it was he, he contributed to society uh, in that sort of, that's called sublimation. Sublimation, you channel your anger, but it's in a way that is not uh, to be used against society, but to serve society. So somehow that happens, it's called sublimation. Actually, we don't have a threat on sublimation. Maybe we'll get there, yeah. Envy and hatred of the feeding mother or breast. Um, the, the, uh, the inability to allow oneself to be fed and satisfied. Insatiable greed or the inability to feed and give to others reflect not only literal feeding, but also emotional feeding as well. So we talked about the, that a little bit in part one. The mother needs, to, the baby needs to be emotionally fed. It's called the reverie, her positive presence, her attitude her warmth, her sense that she's protecting and nourishing her child, she loves her child, that's the emotional feeding. If the emotional feeding doesn't take place, enter greed later on for the material. It doesn't work. Can anyone imagine that biotechnological advances are any less likely to be driven by greed? 
on the contrary, the potential for ethical corruption and exploitation of the public for profit is truly staggering. So, the reason greed doesn't care about others, because when the baby's nursing at the breast, the breast was seen to, as belonging to the child, as a part of the child, but they're angry at the breast. It's called part object relating. Now the breast hurt him, the breast didn't care about him. He identifies with the aggressor breast, okay? doesn't care about others to replay how the mother didn't, the breast mother didn't care about him. So in the greed, they don't care about others to communicate and for him to know that the mother didn't care about him via the misattunement, the malattunement, etc. So the baby felt exploited, used, objectified, thingified, etc. Identifies with the aggressor. So again, when the baby's traumatized, he's going to, in the most severest of cases, he's going to identify with the aggressor, be just like the rejecting mother, and become a caricature of her, and do to others to reenact what the mother did to him because he's still loyal to her in an adhesive bond with the mother called identification with the aggressor or the tar pit of a negative symbiosis because the baby didn't get the love he needed with the mother to leave her and know himself. All babies need to be loved to feel safe, to differentiate, know themselves. If they, if they didn't get it, they identify with her and they're gonna act like her um, to unconsciously still try to save her, by the way, but to maintain the attachment and the loyalty is, well, don't express your anger at the mother because you can't differentiate. So he expresses it sideways. So he imitates the mother. He flatters the mother. He'll do to others what his mother did to him. The mother might be pleased by that because she feels seen. Very dysfunctional, this, this identification with the aggressor. Um, whether because of greed, impatience, Etc. We regularly, though it must be said, some of us more frequently than others, end up behaving in ways that contradict our best intentions and interests. Our, our, best, intent, our best intentions and interests come with differentiation. If the baby didn't get love to differentiate, he's enraged. He's going to replay the interaction with the frustrating mother onto the world somehow, and he's stuck like that. Now, if he tries to heal, it brings up the memory of what happened, and he may not go further. Envy is an important concept because it introduces the innate element into the genesis of dysfunction. It can result in refusal to take in good experiences. Yeah, so if there's too much envy, too much rage, if he does get something good, he can't accept it. So one guy went, one guy did go to the therapist uh, and, sa and said, I'm going to defeat you. I can't accept anything good. I can't accept being helped by you. That means you were good and what you're saying is good. No way. So he was really filled with envy. Uh, okay, in part one, we talked about the slogan, greed is amazing. My greed or your greed, it's all about greed. That's a logical fallacy. Yeah. But somebody uh, said to himself, you know, when I was brainwashed by the, by, the, by the other short sellers, he said to himself, I was faced with the question, what part of me is represented in all this and what they're saying? What part of me is represented in this slogan, greed is, a, greed is wonderful? What part, you see, interesting, very, again, uh, so the growth of the slogan, greed is wonderful, um, he said, I was faced with the question, what part of me is represented in this? Okay. So that guy asked this question, he may not have the paranoid schizoid mode of experiencing. He may be in the depressive position. So trauma early on, that's called the paranoid schizoid position. The splitting mechanism, goddess and demon thinking, idealization of the good side, devaluation of the bad side. Okay. When the baby's traumatized, he sees the outer world as good or bad. He, he only thinks that, which that's called the paranoid schizoid position. 
So the good or bad, that's either be eaten me or you, either or. That's the mentality of the paranoid schizoid position. Okay. So the plunder system operates um, from there. People in the depressive position uh, had the experience of being enough loved uh, so that they can recognize that the mother is one person who's both loving and frustrating. He doesn't need to split and think in these kind of either or ways. Now the people who are in the paranoid schizoid mode, uh, they're very enraged. So all of their energy is in the rage. So they figure out ways to climb to the top, I guess. People in the depressive position don't understand this. Just like the indigenous people didn't understand uh, the cruelty of the invaders, that kind of thing, because the indigenous people love their babies. But uh, the plunder system, the babies are removed and hence traumatized as part of the plunder system. So interesting that somebody could ask this, ask himself this question. Geez, what part of me is represented in this slogan, greed is amazing? So he, he's, he's not really, he, he has to depress the position if he can feel that. We don't know the numbers, we don't have the stats, how many people are still operating from the splitting mechanism. But one estimate is that um, um, 30% of the babies in North America do get a secure attachment style and have a general I'm okay, you're okay attitude, um, a tolerant attitude. Of the remaining 70%, um, maybe half uh, have the codependent pattern, the, the, the depressive position. So love and gratitude have partially entered the psychological picture. And maybe some portion of the other half are in the more, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, but a small percentage of the people uh, think in either or term. Toxic masculinity is there. Um, either or thinking is there. People who hate vulnerability. Because when they were a baby, they were vulnerable. And they were shamed. They identify with the aggressor. The aggressor hated, rejected the child, therefore they hated the child. They identify with the aggressor and think like the aggressor. So when they say they hate vulnerability, they're talking about how the mother hated their vulnerability. So they, their vulnerability is repressed. When it's repressed, it's projected. So if they see vulnerability in others, they say they hate it. That's, that's a reenactment that the mother hated the first, the projector's vulnerability when they were a baby, okay, because they have identified to the aggressor. Now, the weakness they see in the other that they hate so much, actually, that's them, but they don't want to admit it because it's too painful. See? So I, we don't know what percentage of people are doing that, but one therapist says uh, we have to own our projections, resolve splitting, forgive our parents, differentiate, resume development, and grow up. Kind of thing and then by by doing that we, we grow up into i'm okay you're okay anything other than i'm okay you're okay is is dysfunction is a problem all babies begin with i'm not okay mother's okay but with severe trauma they give that up they can't accept the vulnerability that they're not okay they identify with the aggressor now the aggressor was make believe seen as okay the, the in the identification with the aggressor they they adopt that fake belief that the mother was okay and said that's them because they identify with the aggressor. The, aggressor, the, the aggressor's identity from the baby's point of view is that she was, that it was their, the baby hallucinated that she was all good in order to feed safely. He takes that as his identity and says he's all good. That preserves his, nar his uh, unresolved narcissism. It's a manic defense. He can't accept the pain of the shame that he experienced. Now his true self is squelched, repressed. When something's repressed, it's projected. Now, when, so then he's going to say others are not okay. But when he says others are not okay, he's talking about himself, which he sees outwardly. So that's a more severe trauma. This thing called I'm okay, you're not okay, that's a much more severe trauma. That's, a, that's a, what, called a paranoid schizoid position. Or the psychotic part of the personality taking over the non-psychotic part of the mind where the non-psychotic part of the mind functions but it's motivated by the psychotic part that's part we talked about that in part one a little bit 
And in the last video, difficult area to talk about, but it's psychotic if, if you if you think uh, if you think uh, if you're greedy and you you don't need something but you got it and you did it because you don't need it and it's damaging to have it but you gotta have it. The fantasy is that's supposed to be the good breast that should have been there. That's kind of psychotic. Whoa, whoa! What a, what kind of belief is that? And we talked about the link between greed and envy a little bit in part one. Um, Odysseus' greed results in his homecoming being delayed by nine years. The other breast, greed, envy, spite, revenge. Okay, this I don't know about. I don't know about this. That greed and envy is like a breast. I don't know about this. That so the bad is the good, right? The breast is supposed to be good, but greed, envy, spite, revenge is bad. But that's the breast, and the breast is supposed to be good, so bad becomes good. Because so, so the baby's nursing. He needs the breast, but all he has is rage. Rage, envy, spite, vindictiveness. Okay. It's stuck there, but he has these emotions. He, associ he associates that with the connection to the breast. He gets to a point where he thinks, well, that's going to feed him now. So his rage, his emotions into the breast is the link to the breast. Then he says that those emotions are the breast. Hence, the, the, now greed, now envy is a breast. I don't, I don't fully get it. I partially get it, but not fully. Okay, last one here. Manic society, toward the depressive position. That's, that's his uh, thing here. We want to move from um, the manic uh, defenses around the paranoid schizoid mode of experiencing, Melanie Klein's theory. Um, um, in the beginning, the baby adopts, adopts the splitting. His rage, he sees onto the mother and says, the mother's in rage, that's the paranoid part. The splitting, that's the schizoid part, and idealizes the fake one. That's the paranoid schizoid position. The grandiosity, the manic defense, that's, so the manic defense is around the paranoid schizoid position. We want to move from the paranoid schizoid position, meaning splitting, idealization, devaluation, still chasing, the false phantom belief that they're little god that's the grandiosity we want to move from that to we want to, we want to heal that renounce it or whatever somehow um, feel our way out of that yeah krista will says we've got to feel our way so we've got to feel our way out of that somehow into the depressive position the depressive in the depressive position uh, things are more realistic the mother is the same person loving and frustrating it's not goddess or demon we can differentiate and have and then have access to the real self part of the self. Once we get access to the real self part of the self, as described by one of our mentors, James F. Masterson, in his book, The Search for the Real Self. That book, by the way, has won a Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. And we have 21 Golden Windmills of the Mind uh, Awards uh, issued already. The Disney movie mentioned in part one, uh, that, that has won one. Masterson's book, that's another one. Any, so as, okay, so manic society. Um, so we, now we're looking for balance, the two sides, right? So the ability to see two sides of a story, okay? So we look for the, th the third side of the coin holds the other two sides. That's reality. The mother's one person with two sides. That's reality. The mother's one person with two sides to her. Sometimes she's all right, sometimes she misses up, but she's still one person. Any such balance, uh, it can be tenuous, requiring constant work, lest the splitting mechanism overwhelms uh, the mature efforts to see the two sides. You know, part of this ability to see the two sides 
in the next video what are we doing here? oh yeah okay Got some time here. in the next video let's see all people possess both good and bad qualities but babyhood and childhood trauma stimulated defense mechanisms constrict whole person perceptions so the trauma prevents us in our manic defense to not see the reality because we're, too, we're too in too much pain so to feel safe it's not good or bad so we want to get out of that soothe ourselves okay um, Prejudice reflects infantile dependence. Greed reflects infantile dependence. Why don't I do a quick, uh, hold on a sec. The, in their fruitless search for the transformative object. See, the, the, the breast would transform the baby, heal the baby, grow the baby, it's transformative. But when you, buy, when you eat the cookie, that's not going to transform you. In their fruitless search for the transformative object, the greedy become idolaters, worshippers of the sign rather than the signified. So they become addicted to the cookie and not think about that the cookie was supposed to be um, like a sign for the breast. So they don't get that the cookie is a sign for the breast. They're just addicted to the cookie and now they're just chasing the cookie. That's called idolatry, worshippers of the cookie. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll do we'll do um we'll do these quotes tomorrow next time part six. Greed is a threat to society because it is a threat to the self. Greed destroys the mind, the quality of reason. So greed destroys the mind, the quality of reason, because greed is there because the mother didn't offer the reverie with the baby. So the baby doesn't have that experience of being seen and considered and have self-reflection and inward introspection. That didn't take place. So there's greed. Okay. So the mother didn't offer the experience to let the baby have reason. So the reverie helps the baby to have reason. No reverie, no reason, I guess. So greed is the response, the manic response to get the quality to have the ability to have reason but now he be, now he makes an idol idolatry of the thing he's buying the cookies or the the buildings block of buildings whatever he's buying or taking over right? uh, it destroys the mind because he's replaying um, and, he, and he's missing out on the chance of healing the manic defense is a, is a defense against healing so greed is a defense against healing Greed is a defense against healing. So that's destroying the mind, he means. Uh, greed is a term often employed by the greedy to refer to the needy because they interpret want as self-aggrandizing purpose. Scrooge, for example, mentally dismisses the requests of the needy. Yeah, so the genuinely needy, he's, oh, they're so greedy. He's talking about himself. Projection. Greed is a search for a transformative object that never really offers any transformation. Of course, the cookie cannot find some kind of time machine, take itself and the person eating the cookie, try and go back in a time machine, morph back, cookie becomes the breast, the person becomes the baby, cookie... <laughs> the quest narrative hijacked by its own momentum. Yeah. So there's the idolatry. So you're just addicted to the cookie and you don't care about what it signifies. You only, you're only, you only care about the signal, the symbol. You don't care what the symbol symbolizes. Okay, so greed, um, the result of a mental failure to cope with excessive feelings. Oh yeah, so complicated grief, excessive feelings, complicated grief, melancholia, excessive feelings. So excessive acquisi acquisition. Acquisitiveness. Acquisitiveness. The excessive acquisitiveness that defines greed is, ironically, the result of a mental failure to cope with excessive feelings. 
So there's the link between too many feelings, too many, too much greed. Greed is a manic defense to, to excite you and distract you from the pain within. Greed, envy, repeti- these, are, these are to excite you, to distract you from the painful feelings of having been unloved. Over the course of the scene, Scrooge's emotions loosen until he literally, until he is literally sobbing with a mixture of happiness and regret. Regret, the first step on the road to redemption and repentance. The ghost of Christmas past exposes the cause of the old man's bitter substitution of love for money. Yeah. So the Scrooge didn't have quality in childhood. Okay. When there's no quality, he searches for quantity. And the quantity he thinks is a need, not realizing that the greed is chasing the unconscious fantasy that that should be, that, that should be the love that was needed. It isn't, it is not aware of it, repetition compulsion. Forming a bond with the reader, Dickens's narration emphasizes the connection between Scrooge's miserliness and his loneliness. Scrooge, like all greedy individuals, has focused his mind so narrowly on material gain because he is unable to negotiate loss. Yeah, so Scrooge couldn't mourn losses. So greed is a defense against loss. Greed is a defense against mourning. All manic defenses are defenses against loss, admitting loss, accepting loss. So Mr. Scrooge didn't say, oh, I didn't get the love I needed. He, never, he couldn't do that. So greed is an, a way to not do it. Greed is a way to not feel. Greed is a defense against feeling, put it that way. Because in greed, you get the excitement, you get addicted to the dopamine for the chase and the serotonin from the catch. So you're just kind of manic like that. You're just, you're, it's mainly physiological emotions of the physiology issue, um, that the survival, um, right? like the, 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 the animal in the, in, the, in the forest chases, he gets the catch, he gets serotonin. Joy and sadness are in the unconscious. It, another Disney, great movie, it's called Inside Out by, uh, by the Disney company. Uh, what's his name? Pete Doctor is the guy who made it. Great movie, Inside Out, because you can see trauma. That, that movie is about trauma. Okay. Joy and sadness, the repression of those two characters represents the trauma. All that was left on the console for the person okay, was the fear and the anger, okay, the amygdala, the survival personality, hypervigilant, reactive, impulsive. Right? The disgust is mainly about distaste and dismell, so that's more about the physiological side. Okay. But the feeling, the wide range of feelings, so, so Joy is like interest and curiosity and wonderment, self, self reflection. And things are awesome and uh, joy, of course, and celebration. And now the sadness. You got empathy, uh, reparation, the ability to mourn. We need sadness. Sadness is, oh my God, sadness is. So sadness and joy, the whole range there. That's our soul. Right? So the soul got repressed. All he had was the amygdala, the hypervigilant. Stress on stress. So the main emotions are just schadenfreude, envy, greed, spite, vindictiveness, the manic defenses. Right, right. So a person can become like Scrooge at the end, right? Some form or another. Greed is the pathological desire to control those forms of excess by substituting money and material goods for love. The material goods cannot be the needed love from the past. The psychic structure is still there. The, the inability to mourn is still there. That's psychic pain. As a manic defense against that pain, we spin it around because we're addicted to the dopamine for the chase and the serotonin from the catch. The Inferno offers a way of answering, quote, how much is too much? I don't know the story there, but apparently there's some kind of imagery about greed. And the point was, greed is, I think it's some kind of exaggeration of greed. And um, to try to give uh, the, the Dante was trying to give people the feeling of greed. 
What's the feeling of greed? So he tried to create the story to give the reader some kind of feeling of what greed is. Uh, the Midas character asks that everything he touches turn to gold, only to realize he uh, that, realize he has he has touched fatal to those he loves. So there's the the damage. He loses his soul. Right? He touched his daughter, right? And the daughter turned into gold or something. The connection between excessive acquisitiveness and mental corruption. Mental corruption, that's, his, that's her phrasing for trauma. Mental corruption. So the mind became corrupt, psychotic. The mind became psychotic. Greed is psychotic. What the psychotic, greed is psychotic because you don't need it. It's psychotic. What are you doing? Why are you damaging things? It took billions of years to have um, the soil give us this delicious food. What are you damaging? It's psychotic. What are you doing? Well, I'm enraged at what happened. I'm, I'm trying to express my rage on my mother, but I'm afraid to pick up the phone and tell my mother that I'm angry at her. So, and I become her, but I got to express my rage. So I'll just fantasize that uh, this land is, is, is the, my uh, the breast mother, and I'll express, I'll take it out on the land. So he, he displaces it. Morton Keeson says, no, if you're angry at the land or something, pick up the phone and talk to your mother. Um, that's just the first step. That's not the ending of it, because you've got to forgive the mother. So we've got to read the book called um, Hidden in Plain Sight, Understanding Our Puzzling Emotions by Barry Grosskopf. And we did two videos of his work. His other book is entitled, Forgive Your Parents, Heal Yourself. And I think the... I'm very curious about this thing about um, that greed is just a tool for the envy. It's really about envy. Like that guy said, the world is run on envy, not greed. Greed is just a tool for the envy. The envy is the real driver. That means the baby doesn't even want goodness. He's so abused, he's been so shamed, so traumatized, he doesn't want, he's like the Iago, I don't want anything good. I just want to see everything destroyed. He'll spread rumors, get others against him. So I just want to see, see things destroyed. He can't see goodness or accept goodness or accept uh, relationships. He uh, doesn't trust anybody, of course. Um, that'd, be, that'd be vulnerability. But the Scrooge guy, he did accept vulnerability, right? He was nice to the kid in the end. Was it Tim, Tiny Tim or something? <laughs> story I think the idea was when he when they flew when they flew back when the ghost took him back to the nursery it was just to bring up things and he was happy reading the book so he, he, he was happy reading the books and he remembered the characters in the books so he did have something good in the past but it was mixed because he didn't get the love but he got some love because he felt safe to read and then, he, and then um, maybe that was the point where he uh, realized he took a wrong turn or something. He had something good, but it wasn't enough. I don't know the full story about Mr. Scrooge there, but... Okay, we'll talk about these ones and a few others in the next video, part six. But uh, maybe, what I'll, maybe what I can do is... Um, Hold on a sec. Let me just skim through some of um, let me just skim through some of the other ones that we did. Let me pick out some of the um, hold on a sec. Greed is an okay. Greed is an impetuous and insatiable craving, exceeding what the subject needs and what the object is able and willing to give. Oh, here's the quality one. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Um, when the ability to take in the good, to appreciate the quality of a relationship is compromised, the resulting experience of insatiability sets off a preoccupation with quantity. One frequent manifestation of which is greed. 
Well, here it is. Relations between the non-psychotic and psychotic parts of the personality. That is between, on the one hand, the part which being capable of tolerating conflict and frustration is able to learn from experience and to perform symbolic transformations whereby it can obtain such satisfaction as is possible from objects and on the other the part characterized by omnipotence, hate, envy, greed that is unable uh, to tolerate the absence of satisfaction and the existence of objects independent of the self so that a construct of an internal and external reality directed towards the evacuation of frustration, the experience of self, and the knowledge of self. So there's some kind of arrangement going on. The psychotic parts of the personality, that's one part, and the non-psychotic parts of the personality, some kind of arrangement takes place where the person becomes unaware of himself, can't learn about himself, expresses expresses his rage. Greed and envy, psychotherapists exhibiting characteristics are perceived as under-analyzed. Yeah. So if, if the therapist is greedy and envious, it means he isn't analyzed. He didn't get analyzed. It's a precondition. And some shrinks are so greedy and envious, and they don't care, they're corrupt. They like, they're drawn to the profession, someone said, to exercise their greed and envy on the victims. And they don't care, why? Because when they were a baby, the mother didn't care. They identify with the aggressor and cheat the clients because the mother cheated him. So these are the corrupt ones. So, so he wasn't analyzed. He didn't get in touch with his greed and envy. Right? He's just acting it out. Okay, we, okay. So we talked about uh, the speculators could be seen as representatives of greed incarnated. Okay, we talked about um, the protester one. We want him, okay, client considered recovery as reparation and the journey towards the depressive position. In other words, the infantile portion of the personality must renounce its hatred, greed, envy, and omnipotence. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the healing journey. We want to somehow move past, heal, renounce, realize we no longer need, need this greed, envy, omnipotence, hatred, etc. The depressive position entails a capacity to appreciate the wholeness of the thing, the situation. The parents, we see the parents, see their story, they did their best. They were trapped in their repetition compulsion. They couldn't do it all. They would have if they could have. So we've got to forgive our parents, heal ourselves. In our world that is being destroyed by greed and rapacity, rapacity wow. something more than the dominant forms of masculinity is called for. Now this this toxic masculinity is not only in men, it's in women too. Marion Woodman says that women can be just as toxically masculine as men. It's nothing to do with uh, gen gender. Hmm. It is the ability to face the grief. It is the ability to face the grief of your disillusionment in realizing that there is always Okay, greed, envy, competition, all these things, all these symptoms of trauma. And your new ability to contain the pain of this, your new ability to face the truth, the truth will upset you free, which allows you to experience that there are good things. Greed, a neurotic remnant of childhood, a substitute for mother love. Greed in its nature is inherently insatiable and so cannot and cannot be satisfied. Okay, 
interrupts learning. Greed, inter greed and envy interrupt learning. Oh yeah, the phenomena of greed and envy is an inf is in infantile men mental life can be thought of as a breach in the, bo <clears throat> in the bonding experience. Uh, a breach in the bonding experience where the infant no longer feels himself to be a member with his mother, one with his mother, but rather one who feels prematurely too separate and has to scrounge avariciously, like the Scrooge, for himself and or defensively disclaim the value of the nurturing object altogether so as to mitigate the collapse of narcissistic self-esteem, which devolves upon his experience. Okay. That's a good one there. So greed and envy can be thought of as a breach in the bonding experience. The greatest hurt of all, mother failed me. Oh, the Don Juan was greedy for all of the women. No woman could be his mother. So he, so he disappointed again and again. But if he finds one woman who can represent all women, meaning his mother, he might be interested. So this is the girl who's like the number one Miss Universe kind of thing. That's the quantity. So the Don Juan didn't get the quality, so he's looking for quantity. And he had 2,000 women, was it, in the story? So all of these playboys and uh, I like that. Oh yeah, this one here about mixing. This is a good one here. Um, the woman says, the trouble is that I mix up need and greed. But I, I can't see how to make them separate. As soon as I feel need, I feel greed. They are the same. Uncool. Therapist says, uh, I agree. Uh, oh no, she says to the reader, I, I agree, dear reader. And say, uh, and I said, and say that greed, that the greed which makes everything seem useless and nothing, of no value, also keeps her in this terrible, uh, deprived, needy state. Okay, repetition compulsion, he's still needy. Right? So the greed is a link to the unmet need, because the unmet need is the unfinished business. So the greed becomes Envy has its roots in the greed of the oral phase and is insatiable. To plunder the world, it's not a philosophy at all really, but simply an excuse to unleash psychotic hatred and greed and envy. Right? The essence of this harm does not consist in the mere basis, in the mere baseness of human action, but rather a distortion of the rage. Insider trading, greed. The guy who can't stop talking, that's greed maybe. Both sides of the oral coin, starvation and greed. Love starvation and greed. Omnipotent, omnipotence and manic defenses against complicated grief. Jealous possessiveness or greed and the control of external objects. If in greed the destruction is incidental, in envy it's the primary gain. Collectively, we are continually being made aware through one ecological catastrophe after another of the consequences of relating to the earth in a one-sided power-oriented way, though the earth's fate and her response should be no more of a surprise than that of many to love's partners, to, love partners, to loss of love partners. Yeah, so, yeah, she was saying, well, if you treat your spouse badly, you might lose your spouse. Well, if we treat the earth badly, 
Why don't we play Kristen Wilson's speech here? Maybe finally I'll get a transcript. Some, it's, I'm not sure why it works, but sometimes YouTube provides a transcript of my stumbled talking. But if there's music above, it won't do it. Here it's quiet, so I'm thinking maybe finally we can get a transcript. So I'm going to play you a, a, a short um, speech called Ooh My Soul by Kristen Wilson. Uh, it's sort of an environmental kind of speech. Um, and she talked about... Um, so greed is in relation to problems with the breastfeeding. So then we see the earth as the breast. So we, and we, it's just supposed to serve and give. We don't have a relationship. There's no reverie with the earth because the mother didn't offer us reverie. So there's no consideration for the earth because the mother didn't give us consideration. Okay? Meaning the nerve lines, there were no nerve lines between the breast and the child's, and the nerves inside the child. Something about the mucosa nerves or something. Actually, we have a quote about the earth breast. Is it here? Is it here? Hold on a sec. Um... Uh, I know it's in here about the earth breast. Let's see. Oh, here's a key one while we're here. Here's a very good one. When the colonizer, in their own paranoid schizoid position, projects their free, their fear, greed, envy outward, they engage with the colonized as though something is being taken away from them, leaving the colonized, leaving the colonized positioned to attempt perpetually to undo this fear. So mother plundered the baby, baby identifies with the aggressor, they don't express their anger at the mother, but they want to be the mother to, to act like her, to know what she did to him, so they plunder the stuff on the other side of the river, but as they do it, they are reminded of the mother plundering them. So when they steal other people's stuff, they are triggered of how the mother stole their stuff, so they feel victimized. But they don't say they don't have the memory of the mother victimizing them so that image of the aggressor they put on the victim and says no the the victim just hurt us so they hurt the other hocus pocus double focus the fusion as he's being the aggressor shaming the other to reenact how the mother shamed him or plundered him he sees the aggressor mother onto the victim and says that he was just plundered or hurt by the one he just hurt So repetition compulsion is we replay what happened to feel what happened. We're looking for feelings. The purpose of repetition compulsion is to get our feelings. We repeat because we don't have our feelings. We lost joy and sadness. We are repeating to get joy and sadness back. When, so when we reenact what happened, the attempt is to get joy and sadness back if we can accept it. So repetition compulsion is a mirror to see what happened in childhood. Then we can start to get the feelings back. Okay? Hence the basket and the egg. The knowledge is the basket and the egg. The feelings will come back. Okay, never mind here about the earth breast. Let's just play Kristen Wilson here. Let, let me cue this up here. It's about nine minutes long. And, um... The energy out of them, so they become little black. Oh, here we go.
equation is not enough. We are destroying the earth for reasons that are bigger than economics. You see, we are afraid of death. We are afraid of this earth, this nature that will bring us back to dust. We are afraid of the dust and the dirt that will claim us, or the waters that we came from, and thus afraid of women's bodies, the bridges by which we walk this earth. An intellectual atheist, performance artist, and spiritual crisis wrote this sermon. <laughs> Because this revolution is about a religion in one of its original meanings, relinking, reconnecting the lives of women raped and murdered daily are fought in this struggle. The lives of indigenous peoples are fought in this struggle. The men and women lost in the empty addiction of power, these infantile gods will grow into their souls if we win. We must win. If, if the pioneers had a man of this destiny to colonize, control, and consume, then the pioneers should have a man of to decolonize, create, and commune. But this must be a spiritual revolution, not just the environment separate and distinct from its home and all and everything. You see, if this is a spiritual revolution, if we get to feel as we fight, if we just get to feel as we fight, then we have already won. Amen. A women. A planet. Our soul. One point that hasn't been made uh, regarding your speech is, um, hold on a sec, is um, the, the baby thinks he's going to perish if, he, if he's uh, not, not loved properly, right? If he doesn't see the mother around or something. So maybe that's the fear. The person's going to be manic in the greed and envy because otherwise they're going to be reminded of the feeling they once had where they thought they wouldn't make it. For example, if the baby doesn't see the mother around, the baby doesn't understand time, that means there's no mother. The baby is now living with no mother, and is, how long is he gonna make it with no mother? N no baby could make it without a mother. But during that time, he's terrorized uh, emotionally that he's not gonna make it. So that's the fear of uh, perishing. So as a defense against that, those painful feelings. A person may be manic the rest of their lives. Now what did they need? They needed the good breast. Okay. So um, the breast is seen on the earth or any material, any items, anything external, money, material, matter, which all by the way sh share the same root word with mother. M-A-T-E-R apparently means mother in, in Latin, but from that M-A-T-E-R you get material, money, matter, alma mater, anything with mother comes from there. So, so in the unconscious, something that's considered to be good, material, it's a concrete symbol where the, where the psychotic part of the personality is going to say, no, I don't care. That's, that's a symbol for, for what I needed. He's going to have the fantasy that the building he's going to buy or whatever is the breast. It doesn't work, but he keeps doing it because he can't face the memory 
of uh, what happened to him. That's why the suggestion has been made that mothers stay in bed for five months. Mothers just stay in bed for the first five, for the first four to five months. Provide that core basic womb that the baby needs. Baby sleeps on the mother for four to five months, skin to skin contact. If she needs to use the restroom, she carries the baby. Maintain the, the skin to skin contact for the first four to five months. Baby feeds as he wants, as he needs, unconditional. Um, provides the attunement. Um, lets the baby feel that warmth and safety of the womb life. Let him have his paradise. Let the baby have his paradise for the first four to five months. The father doesn't grab the baby. The, the contact, the physical contact is continuous, unbroken for the first four to five months. Now, the mother has to be comfortable with this. So the role of the father is to make the mother, his wife, comfortable. She can read up, she can catch up on her reading. Okay, no scary movies, no arguments, no smoking, no, no damaging things. Um, let the baby feel like he was in the womb. It's called the extended womb. If he gets that, if he gets those needs met, with the reverie, with the lime, with the natural, no bottle, no schedule. Again, I'm not a doctor, but so barring emergencies and special exceptions. At, at birth, the baby, the baby's placed on the mother's front. He starts latching and suckling right away, often. And because of the hormones that are produced, um, it helps the mother to feel that connection with the baby. It not only helps the baby to bond to the mother, but it helps the mother have the needed response by that. If the baby's removed, betrayal. Greatest hurt of all, mother failed me. Baby doesn't say, oh, it wasn't my mother's. My mother didn't remove me from her. Someone else, maybe he's not going to think that. He'll just think the mother did it. So he's enraged at the mother. So the trust is broken. Now he's relating to a stranger. He can never really trust again. So he never really gets his second womb. He won't achieve his psychological birth. Later on, he'll be greedy to replay and search for the love that he needed, to search for the sweetness with the mother that he needed. So search for that sweet reverie that, that was missing. But underneath it, he feels rage, what happened? Um, Rage gone awry. Now, at some, at, to some degree, the envy's there because it's afraid of goodness. So he's greedy. Okay. Now, greed, incidentally, is destructive. And the greedy part likes that. And hence the quote by the plunder system guy, the world is driven by envy, not greed. You may think it's just greed. But the greed is doing the destruction. The greed is destroying the earth. That's because of the envy. Envy can't tolerate goodness. For the baby to consider goodness, he once did it. He once tried to accept the goodness. And what happened? He thought he wasn't going to make it. So he doesn't want to feel that again. So he'll be manic the rest of his life. Greedy and envy. Com repetition compulsion to take in due to the part of the organism trying to heal. So greed is an attempt to heal, let's say. But his real feeling underneath it, a simultaneous feeling that goes along with it is the envy. So there's the expression of the rage and not, to not see goodness. And greed destroys the goodness. So he's doing both. He's, he's loyal to the repetition compulsion to heal and he's loyal to the envy to see goodness damaged. Yeah, so there's the grenvy. I think that's a great phrase by... Um, I forgot who came up with it. Oh, gee, I forgot. Underappreciated phrase, Grenby. Was it Bor Harold or something? Harold? Something? Doesn't, doesn't matter right now. Um, let's talk about salvation. And I do not mean a peach smoothie and a massage. <laughs> so she's talking to a pampered, spoiled uh, crowd, maybe. Um, but her conclusion was, we got to feel. Yeah, we got we to gotta feel. When we feel, 
uh, we get our identity, we stop repeating. We repeat. So greed and envy, these are defenses against feeling. Greed and envy keep joy and sadness repressed in the Disney movie. If we can confront this greed and envy and grandiosity, uh, then maybe joy and sadness can come back in. But greed and envy and grandiosity, cynicism and all that, that keeps joy and sadness away. And all you have at the console is the fear and anger. That's the manic defenses. That's survival mode. Then they come up with the slogan, eat or, eat, eat or be eaten. Greed is wonderful. Greed is wonderful. My greed or your greed. They come up with these slogans in reference to the paranoid schizoid mode. These are the slogans of the amygdala. These are the slogans of the overstimulated, overexcited, traumatized person, whereby when there's trauma, the amygdala becomes hyperstimulated. And then the slogans are in reference to the trauma. So these are traumatic slogans, eat or be eaten, that kind of greed is good. My greed or your greed. These, these, these are slogans uh, from the infantile rage and the manic defense of the splitting mechanism, either or. In the depressive position, it's cooperation. It's, I'm okay, you're okay. It's the recognition that you're a person, we're, I'm a person, and we move towards further and further understanding. You see? So that's the healing, that's the normal development. So she calls that re-evolution. Evolution, again. The baby had an evolution for his biological birth, got stunted. Now we want to continue, resume evolution, development. That's called re-evolution, evolve again. I think we can apply that to the personal idea that when we heal trauma, um, we are resuming evolution, personal development, meaning. Uh, now, collectively, uh, if we confront uh, logical fallacies and, and we grow up that way, right? How are we doing here? Um, now we're left here. Let me, uh, hold on a sec, let me, uh, let me fix something here. Well, let's see if the, I can go back to the pool. Hold on a sec. I bet you they're still there. Oh, okay, they're gone. Oh, good. Oh, good, good, good. So I'll leave the camera, I'll leave the computer here. You know, I do want to play a song. I can come back and play a song. Yeah, let, let's go down to the pool for a minute. See, here's where I was, here's where I wanted to do my video. See, it's nice and quiet here. It's a holiday here. That's why, no functions, no parties or anything. Oh, there's some people there. Oh, there are, oh, there are. Oh, there's a bunch of people there. Oh yeah, so there's people. But they're not, see, there's my seat there, you see? I was gonna do my video right there. <laughs> there you can just do a quick, quick visit there. So yeah, um, I love doing it by the pool there. I don't want to get these people in the camera, but they keep walking in front of me here. Awesome. Ah, yeah, okay. Here we go. Oh, it's nice to get some fresh air here.
So, um, I can start my video now. I should, you know, I thought about it. I thought about why don't I wait an hour and come back? Maybe they'll leave. This area was filled with people before. Oh yeah, here's my favorite spot. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm comfortable in this spot here. Well, we'll add more quotes to this topic on greed. The quality, the sweetness is missing. So it is compulsion to still get it, but nothing in the present can get it. The psychotic part of the personality thinks that the thing can be it because it, it doesn't understand time. It's just always in the now. So if the press is not there, what about the cookie? What about the, the buying that thing? What about uh, plundering stuff of the people on the other side of the lake? So they're greedy and it's manic. Repetition compulsion. So greed is the repetition compulsion of the trauma in the nursery with the mother. Yeah. Still trying to have this psychotic fantasy that stealing other people's stuff, I guess, then they have the love from the mother. That's psychotic. It's psychotic. If you and, it's, and it's aggressive and violent because the mother was so like that. So the baby thinks the mother was so aggressive and violent. Oh, got some stuff here. They're preparing, the staff are preparing for some function. There's almost always a function going on here. If it's a wedding, a meeting, a conference, um, it's very rare to find this place relatively uh, free. Just some uh, ladies with their kids here. Well, what else did Kristen Wilson said? So that, that by the way, is from the, a radio program called Gleamings of the Earth episode entitled Air, Earth, Water, Fire. One of my favorite lines is, um, if you're not in your body, you're not making sense, literally. And it is disembodied discourse that is, that is getting us into this uh, problem, that is giving us this problem. Because we're not in our bodies, we're, we're disconnected. We're searching for our embodiment. We're searching for our feelings. I feel, therefore I am. We lose that with trauma. The baby loses that with trauma. The woolly mammoth is frozen in the block of ice. So, so the panic is to replay what happened to see if we can get back our feelings. So, so envy is the rage. Greed is the repetition compulsion to still get in. Greed causes destruction, so the greed, so the envy part is satisfied. But it's displacement. The person's rage at the breast is displaced onto, onto whatever it is they're destroying. They're not healing because they're not directing their anger at the mother. Or they're not engaged in the mourning process of understanding the mother to bring up the feelings to be able to forgive the mother and differentiate. The goal is to differentiate. We're trying to differentiate, know ourselves. You got some work here. Okay, why don't I go back? I can play a song. Maybe I can come back here. Hold on a sec. Let's finish up with the, the song here. Let's go back in.
I mentioned yesterday about four songs by indigenous singers. Um, so I mentioned two songs by the band Eastern Owl, and we played uh, Child Protection. And um, they have another song called Indian Act. It's the 21st, it's the, it's the 21st goddamn century. Come on, leave us alone. Um, but see, the short sellers are traumatized. They don't understand time. So they're plundering. And we don't go into all the details of how they plunder. All of that information is widely available. It's not really... Um, I want to focus on the psychoanalysis here. But uh, they're right. When the, when the indigenous people go on camera and say, you're still hurting us, you're doing all these awful things with the reservation and uh, creating conditions for our suffering and then um, and just waiting for us to make a mistake, uh, you're, you're hurting us. And then the people doing this, and why do you hate us? Like they, they keep saying that. Why do you hate us so much? Because when the, when the plunderers plunder someone and they hurt them they hate them afterwards people they they hate the ones they hurt okay because they are reminded of how the mother hurt hurt them but they can't feel that or admit that so they project the aggressor onto the victim and as they are reminded of having been hurt by the mother they simultaneously project all that and say well the victim hurt me just now no, you projected and then you triggered yourself. Your, your aggressive action triggered up yourself what the mother did to you. We replay and reenact to get back our feelings, you see? So this message, uh, how do we get it out there? Like, I think it's, uh, I think it's a lot, I think it's pretty good in terms of uh, offering some kind of grip on understanding uh, why people hate the ones they hurt. It's a, pro it's a projection, right? They hate the, the mother that hurt them, but they don't want. But they're loyal to the mother because they become her. That's what happens in trauma. It's called identification with the aggressor. Um, so yeah, we played four songs uh, by indigenous singers. Uh, two by the band. Um, well, in the summer I played these four songs, but uh, my summer videos got lost um, uh, from May to August 2020. I did 17 videos on the shoreline. Excellent videos. Some of my best material, unfortunately, well, fortunately, the quotes are saved, but my commentary and the self-help exercises we did and the songs we played got lost. So I'm now in the process of replaying some of the songs that were played in the summer. So yesterday we played one called Child Protection by Eastern Owl. Uh, the other one by Eastern Owl called Indian Act, uh, it's, it's not on YouTube, it's, but I see it's on Spotify, so I don't have access to that one. Uh, the other two were uh, Child of the Government, um, about um, the, forced, uh, the forced removal of the babies. So 20,000 babies were ripped away from the mother's arms, you know, to destroy the culture and everything, to break their spirit. And we did play the song Broken Spirit by another indigenous singer. And the fourth one is Gentle Warrior um, by uh, Kalolin Johnson. Kalolin or Kalolin? Kalolin or Kalolin Johnson. High school student, this indigenous singers, um, uh, Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq people. So they have a song called "Gentle Warrior," um, and in the pref and you can see the music video for it. And in the introduction, there's a sign there that says that explains how um, how their language, is, how their culture, tens of thousands of years of uh, sophisticated, subtle culture about herbs and storytelling, languages art, all their songs and music got destroyed by the plunder system. The Beotuk people, B-E-O-T-H-U-C, is that UK, I think? They got to, they, they didn't want to be enslaved. So indigenous people took care of the invaders, but then the invaders hated them because you're nice, you're good, we hate goodness. So they um, hurt, enslaved them, hurt them. The Beotuks apparently re resisted and they're gone. Yeah, they're destroyed. There's a, only, one, only one minor reference to it, which is a, a trailer to a documentary which isn't even avail, available. 
but in that one minute clip, um, there was reference to, to their existence, the Biotak people in northern Tur Turtle Island, what is now known as Newfoundland. Right? Very sad story. They said there's some artifacts there. And in the clip, they said there might be a few survivors because there was this huge massacre. And what a cruel thing, eh? So, uh, so uh, the, in the clip, they said, well, there might be a few survivors because they blended in with some other indigenous group that was enslaved or something. But um, anyways, um, that was in the, in, in the video, in the video um, introduction to the song Gentle Warrior by Kaolo Lynn Johnson, or Kaolo Lynn Johnson. Um, they put a little introduction there about all of their culture being destroyed by the plunderers, by the greedists, by the enviousts and the greedists, the paranoid schizoid, the psychotic core. core uh, Oh, something good. Look at all this they got. Well, destroy it. But we can destroy it by taking it. So the greed part is an attempt to get the love, which they can't get. But the greed destroys, and that's what they're after. So that's what, he, that's what the, short, the famous short seller said. Multi-billionaire recently went on TV and said, Dear world, it's not about greed. This whole thing is not about greed. You think it's all greed. Yes, we brainwashed you to say greed is wonderful uh, because we wanted to trick you. Right? Um, to make it acceptable uh, because we benefit from your greed but what we really want is the destruction it's the envy that's driving all this so we promote and say greed is wonderful uh, because we're really after our own envy so you are all proxies for our rage at our mothers so all of you joining the plunder system you're acting out the proxy uh, of our rage for us but it's, but it's all misplaced. Even if others express the projector's uh, envy, he doesn't heal because the only way for that guy to heal is to take it up with his mother. If you have a problem, quote, uh, Placard said, if you have a problem with your identity, take it up with your parents, he said. Finding proxies to get to, to displace onto others is not going to heal you. So in the Gentle Warrior song, uh, they started off with a poet, uh, Rita Joe, Rita, Rita jo, and she said, you know, um, we nurse our babies, uh, we love our babies, and hold them and sing lullabies and things. And we don't do the kinds of things that you do. So we're concerned about you. Really, we are. We're concerned about you. And she said, we care about you. Really, we do. They heard us. And, um, but, but, her temp but her sentiment is, there's something wrong with you. And yes, you're hurting us. Well, you're really in pain for you to do this awful thing. And yes, we're hurt. And, but it's our orientation to, to care, we, to care. So we care about you as well. Um, so that was in the preface. You'll hear it here in the song, Gentle Warrior. Why don't we play it now? Um, I, I don't have the video here. I just have the audio. So the first part is silent because they're playing the, they're showing the titles, um, they're putting signs there. But, um, so it'll start in a minute here. Yeah, so this silent part, um, you, you'll, you'll see on the screen about all of the, all of the culture being destroyed. There's Rita Joe on the typewriter. She's a revered uh, poet of the Mi'kmaq people. And you're going to hear her speaking. This is Rita Joe. I am the one who walks like a king. I am the one who cares not always to win. The wars I do not care, they hurt us all. You make it so hard, you always want to win. Please believe we care and do understand. I am the one who walks like a king.
I never forgot it. Yeah, so, so with trauma, it's, it's in the unconscious. So we try to get it back. These are high school kids doing it. This was a high school project. A great job, great video. Uh, Gentle Warrior by uh, Carlo Lynn Johnson. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think it's... Uh, the poet there had a, has a famous poet, uh, a poem called "I Lost My Talk." I lost my talk. with trauma. We lose our voice, you see. And, um, and now it does seem that now they're trying to speak up a little bit more. Now they're showing some signs of speaking up. What's wrong with you, people? What are you doing to us? Um, and why do you still hate it? What do you? After all you did, you're, you hate us. You got to be kidding. Um, so that, that's the theory here. That's what, that, here's where psychoanalysis can help. Yeah? The, the aggressor, um, is reminded of how the mother aggressed against them. They project the aggressive mother onto the victim. Then they sit, okay? So we have a, a you know, it's interesting. Uh, I have a short uh, in 1001, Windmills of the Mind. Uh, entitled on those who hurt others who then proceed to hurt the ones uh, to hate the ones they hurt again on those who hurt on those who hurt others who then proceed to hate the ones they hurt and it's from Edmund Burglar one of our mentors and he, he has a little quotes uh, from other famous authors like Seneca and uh, Thomas Dryden and Fuller Dostoevsky Dostoevsky has he has one from him as well if I remember correctly, it goes uh, from from one of his novels. It says um, a guy asked the guy, "Hey, uh, why why do you uh, hate that guy so much?" Uh, quote. He says, "Oh yes, it's true. This person did me no harm. In fact, it is I who committed a crime on him, and my conscience bothers me, and that's why I hate him. To be reminded uh, of some kind of guilt that I, did he do something wrong." But uh, we can update that with this one here. Let's get it back here. But um, one sec. 
It began with colonizer. See, we've got, we now have five videos of quotes, roughly over, so we've got about, uh, what, 25 times five. We've got about 130 quotes here. So a pretty good collection here. Let's see. Where is it again? Omnipotence and oral greed are almost always associated. Every person towards whom oral greed desires are directed stands for the good or bad breast. The projection of goodness led to a depletion of goodness in the self and therefore to an increased oral greed. Shopping became a symbol of our greed. Yeah, and the thumb-sucking one. See, that's a symptom of trauma. See, it started already with the child. The poor child was dissatisfied at the nursing experience, and he's turning to his own little finger to, oh, my God, poor kid. Right? The mother should immediately realize there's something wrong. The father should step in. What's going on here? Why aren't you breastfeeding properly? Why does the child take more comfort from the pacifier? It shouldn't be like that. Oh, here it is. Okay, so when the colonizer, when the short seller, when the insider trader, okay, in their own paranoid schizoid position, okay, denial, deep denial, splitting, all good, all bad, idealization, devaluation, greed, manic defenses, envy, hate, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude, okay, all cloaked over with some kind of childlike charm, maybe. But underneath, Underneath, in their own paranoid schizoid position, psychologically, underneath, when they project their greed and envy outwardly, okay, they engage with the victim as though something is being taken away from them. Okay? So they're, they're in this timeless feeling of the, mund- of the mother plundering them. The, the mother is plundering the baby's soul. The mother is devouring the baby's innocence and decency and soul. Okay? So the plundering outwardly triggers how the mother plundered them. Then they project the aggressive mother onto the victim and say, Oh, the one they just hurt, just hurt them. You see? So they can, there, there's, there's a pretty good reason uh, for understanding why some person might say, Oh, yeah, I don't like... Uh, such and such. You, you, you just hurt them. Yeah, well, I don't like them. Well, they hurt me. Uh, they're no good. What are you talking about? You, you just hurt them. Um, and they don't see, the, see the, they can't think about it because that ability to think about it comes from the line during the breastfeeding. Again, the baby's nurse latches onto the breast. The real breast has nerves that link to the mother. The mother provides a reverie. Okay, the reverie by the mother through the nerves in the breast goes into the baby's something the nerve the nerve mucosa or something like that the nerves in the baby so the babe so the line is there just like there was a line between the baby and the cord through the placenta to the mother there was a line there that line has to continue that's why mothers maybe should just stay in bed for four to five months offer that line offer that lifeline uh, the emotional feeding offer that emotional feed that emotional feeding offers the person the ability to think and make and then question it okay? Um, to ask these kind of questions. They could read a quote like this, maybe, and go, oh, okay, that's interesting. Let's think about it. Do some research, maybe. And, oh, yeah, this one about, okay, short selling increases uh, the susceptibility of a population to... Let's never mind that one. Never mind that one. But you can read it there. It's in one of our quotes. So some of the quotes are related to the plunder system, but most of it's about psychoanalysis. When the baby's traumatized, all he has left is primary narcissism. 
So the true self is when the baby's true self is squelched, shamed, vulnerability, despised, seen outwardly. All he's got left is the primary narcissism, the phantom glory image of himself being a little god in the womb, and he's chasing that. Okay. When he identifies with the aggressor, it fuels it. Okay. So identification with the aggressor is really, uh, really a, a huge temptation because it preserves the grandiosity. The combination of his leftover grandiosity blurred in with the aggressor, that's called the false self. So, so the personality behind the greed and envy, that's, that's the false self. The true self is wounded, seen unto others, and hated and despised because they identify with the aggressor and think like the aggressor. But it's a misunderstanding. It's all a misunderstanding. It's not the baby's job to save the mother. The baby did survive, but emotionally, he can't just bring it back by himself so easily. We need to so-called symbolize it, talk about it. What has happened to these insecurely attached children has dominated their motivating unconscious fantasies and they have become subject to the compulsion to repeat the events of their emotionally deprived past. The most destructive effect of emotional child abuse is perhaps the need to hold on to the abusing parent by identifying with them. This becomes part of the compulsion to repeat the experiences. So identification with the aggressor is an intense sign of trauma. So there's an intense repetition compulsion. An intense repetition compulsion at that level is going to be envy and greed and grandiosity and so on. Shen Gold. The young infant's world might be imagined as consisting of a good breast experienced as the source of life-giving nurturance and a bad breast experienced as frightening and dangerous on account of the infant's own aggression that has been projected onto it. So the, so the bad breast is infused is seen as dangerous and frightening. The boogeyman or whatever, the monster, guy with the horns. Okay? On account of the baby's rage being being projected into that imagine that of that image. So first you got the breast, baby has enraged, says that the breast image thing is enraged. He wants to take in? No, the monster wants to take him in. So he denies it. He's bonded to it, acts like it, projects it, flips it around, hocus pocus, double focus, does it and thinks the other did it to him. Because he's too, he's too bonded. So greed means you're st he's, there's still an infantile bondage with the rejecting mother. Greed means the person is still in an infantile psychological bondage. So he's married to mom, put it that way. Greed means, quote unquote, married to mom. The title of a self-help book, not bad, called Married to Mom. Psychologically married to mom. That's what they're referring to. Splitting an idealization, maintaining some link with a good object, a manic defense against the depression or sadness, the abandonment depression that would rise if the client, if the client were to have insight into the real nature of the object. I've got a lot of great quotes in here. That's from 76 and 77. That's, you know, yesterday when I played the song um, Child Protection by the band Eastern Owl, there was some music in the background. And here it's nice and quiet, so let, let's have a quiet uh, version of the song. And first, I don't really have, I'm sorry, I don't really have any um, views to show you here. Maybe I can find something outside. Huh? Okay, um, let's see. What if I just showed you this uh, cabinet? Does that, does that work? I just, does that look all right? Hold on a sec. Oh, what about right here? How's, how's this one? Does that work? Have I just show you that? Well, sorry, I don't, I don't have any pretty birds flying around to show you. 
So here's a song called uh, Child Protection. Uh, get a box of tissues out for this one. And uh, we'll play uh, Jenny Luzon's song, uh, Broken Spirit, next time. Yeah. So, so non-threatening substitute others. So in projection, okay, um, somebody's safe. Now, when you feel safe, feelings come up, right? So if, if someone is safe, um, they're non-threatening, so they're safe, then you project more. Stuff comes up. Feelings come up. Just like in... Just like in grief work, grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. The caring other, you feel safe. So feelings come up, you can grieve. Okay? So if you know someone or people out there that are safe, then feelings come up, you project more. Huh? Um, so if the memory is having been shamed, the person identifies with the aggressor, they want to replay what happened to them, they say negative things about others, um, to reenact how the mother didn't say negative things about them. Okay? So the non-threatening substitute other, however it is they're safe. Okay? Um, maybe they're, they're t they ha they've been loved, so they're, they have an adult temperament or something, or they're, they're um, raised in a uh, non-cynical way or non-sadistic way. 
um, or maybe sometimes people are disadvantaged. Now, newcomers to a country, they're often disadvantaged. Maybe they're traumatized, so you think, well, they're, you know, you know maybe you think they're safe that way because they don't have social connections or something. However, it is, or an authority, authority figure is often considered safe. So your family doctor, you feel safe with your family doctor. So you might, whenever you feel safe, uh, stuff can come up, right? Um, either to mourn or to reenact. But if you reenact, it's to mourn ultimately. The, reenact, the reenactment okay, is to catch yourself. And what am I doing? Okay, Morton Keeson says, your judgments about others directed to the true source. Talk about your parents now. The thing you're saying about the non-threatening, peaceful, substitute other, those negative things you're saying, okay, that's, that's meant for your parent, so direct it towards the parent. But the person's afraid to do so because that would mean breaking the deal with the parent. But a person needs to break the deal with the parent to, to mourn and know themselves. To maintain the negative deal with the parent means they don't grow up. So greed and prejudice is um, loyalty to the rejecting mother, an infantile dependence on the mother. Put it that way. So greed and prejudice and envy is infantile dependence on the rejecting mother. They didn't grow up. They didn't leave the mother. They didn't know themselves. They don't have their feelings and their identity. So Kristen Wilson was saying, got, got to feel and find your identity. Okay. So greed, envy, and so on, prejudice, this is infantile loyalty and dependence to the shaming mother, meaning the person didn't leave the mother. They don't know themselves. They don't have their identity. Differentiation, leaving the mother leads to identity. Still being fused with the mother, still being married to the mother, you don't know your identity. Or, or being just like her, the same thing. We don't, a person doesn't know their identity. We know our identity when we forgive the parents and then differentiate by the forgiveness. So forgive your parents, heal yourself, says uh, Barry Grosskopf. A pretty good book of his called um, um, Hidden in Plain Sight, Understanding Your Puzzling Emotions or Our Puzzling Emotions. Another good book recently covered, so that's one self-help book. Yeah, we do self-help books as well. Another good self-help book we covered recently was um, written by North America's second female shrink, Josephine Jackson. Her book, a very good book called Outwitting Our Nerves. She says, your nerves, don't blame your nerves. Oh, I have a nervous condition, my ner my, the fault of my nerves, weak nerves. No, 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 those are just the cables. Blame the person who's sending too much stress down the nerves. The nerves snap. Heal the person, the nerves repair itself. The soul is its own source of healing. So heal the person, heal the soul, the nerves will come back in. So that's the body-mind link. So the broken nerves um, is a symptom that there's a problem in the emotional department, psychological department. Let's go back down to the, let's see if I can go back down now. Let's see. Oh, looks promising. All right. This, uh, if this uh, suddenly cuts out, that'll be the end of the video. So my storage is running out here. So remember a narcissist, he looks into the pool of water and he sees a reflection of himself in the pool of water. The object of my affection is my reflection. That's a metaphor. Again, myths and fairy tales describe psychology. So, narcissist being transfixed with his image of himself in the pool of water. That's the phantom glory image of himself being um, the little god that he thought he was in the womb. It talks about unresolved symbiosis. 
the, the story of narcissists is unresolved symbiosis. So the greed and the envy is unresolved symbiosis. So every, right? So we had a quote today about that, the quest for fusion. So greed is the quest for fusion. Okay? The, the paradise was lost. So the greed is the, is the a quest to get back the lost paradise. Okay? Yeah, look at this. I used this. This is where I did most of my videos here, right here. It's all empty here. So we'll uh, see what happens. Um, I guess one reason I like this is I can wander around a little bit sometimes. You know, I, can, I can talk and walk a little bit. Yeah, so narcissist. And we saw Echo off to the side. That's his disembodied soul, his feelings, huh? So he's, that, that, that's disassociation, okay? Or repression. It's in this other world. Echo is in this other world, right? And you can only hear like a little whisper. Huh? And he ignores, he ignores himself. So the story of narcissism um, means the trauma was so great, he wasn't able to go on the second journey of midlife. He wasn't able to Consider Carl Menninger's quote. The greatest hurt of all, mother failed me. If, if, if the mother failed Narcissus, that's why he's staring at himself in the pool of water. That's a symbol to, to re reflect that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. Okay? His, his, his symbiotic needs um, were incomplete. And he's stuck there. He's frozen there. He's like transfixed. He's frozen there. He's frozen. He didn't develop. He couldn't leave the pool of water, find a woman to relate to and have companionate love. He, he reje and, one, and many interpretations of narcissists is that Echo, if we were to borrow that image of his disassociated soul, Echo, see, in a myth or a fairy tale, everything belongs to one psyche. It's all within. So Echo is a part of the person. It's a part of the protagonist. Okay? So the protagonist has a disembodied soul, that's Echo, and he has unmet symbiosis. Or, if we just borrow that um, to make another point, Narcissus doesn't have any kind of relationship with women. Echo is not an external character, but often people interpret that. Okay? For Narcissus to have a, gen a companionate love, uh, he needs to leave the symbiosis. Now he can leave it. Um, he can think. He can think that he leaves it with his manic defense, but the manic defense is still it. Greed is still unmet symbiosis. Greed, envy is still unmet paradise. The baby cannot have paradise lost at birth. It shouldn't happen. Again, mothers stay in bed for four to five months. Let the babies have their paradise. It's just four to five months, what's the big deal? Right? I say she, she just stay, stays in the apartment or the home for four to five months, holding the baby the whole time, skin to skin. But mostly the baby's sleeping, right? So she just stays in bed most of the time. The baby will feel very soothed and warm and very loved by this. So it's a sacrifice. Is it a sacrifice for the mother to do this? Four to five months for the emotional health of your child? It's a minimal, if you ask me. He'll be happy. He can be happy for... 80 years, you only pay four months for that. Now between, now it's not completely over, between four to five months to 36 months, the mother has to provide mirroring. If the, if the mother sees the child, it's like the reverie in, during the, the nursing, the, the first four to five months, but now it's with the eyes. So the whole body did it, now the eyes. So the child looks into the mother's eyes and the mother sees that he's unique now. Now the unique, because he's differentiating, he's unique. Nature's greatest miracle, he's, he's unique. If the mother sees and accepts the child's uniqueness, 
and the child sees that about himself reflected in his mother's eyes or seen in his mother's eyes because the fusion is still going on. He can have that for himself now, just like the reverie was going on for himself. So if the mother hears the child, if the mother feels the child, the child can hear and feel himself. So he, he's connecting to himself, you see. At 18 months, the primary narcissism dissipates and now the mother functions more as a secure base. Um, now, the, now the child is running around more. He's more of an explorer. He's going to be more autonomous. As, as he's learning about the world and how he's separate and others are separate, he's going to run back to his mother sometimes for quote-unquote emotional refueling. But it's not necessarily for mirroring and it's not, and it's not for symbiosis. It shouldn't regress. It's for improv. Now the, the mother does what's called communicative matching or improv. Child says, look what I found. I found this nice uh, cute little flower here. And the mother says, well, okay, well I know about that flower. Really? Yeah, it's got a name. Yeah, it's in the book here. Let's go get the book. Oh, cool, Mom, you're going to show me, you're going to teach me about that flower? Awesome. You know, so um, the mother is uh, like, a, like a coach or a teacher or helping the child become more independent and autonomous, teaches the baby how to, where the books are and how to, how, to, how to look at the index and teaches them how to read about flowers and how to write flowers. So the, ch the, ch so the mother's more like a, the first teacher like that. Then by, eight, by the age of three, because of that, um, mainly the child sees that the mother's not using him to comfort her. Okay. Some mothers are afraid of the child's autonomy because then she'll feel lonely. So she fixes it to reward the child's regression but punishes his autonomy. And there are many ways the mother can punish her autonomy. One of the main ways, Masterson says, is she just withdraws her loving motherly presence. She just withdraws as a form of punishment and rejection. That keeps the baby hooked in. He can't, he can't finish the process. If that takes place between 18 months and 36 months, he's still better off than the trauma in the earlier phases. He'll be, he'll be like restless and kind of a codependent clinger. He'll, think that, he'll still think that he's not okay and others are okay. But the earlier trauma, before 18 months, they give up. They identify with the aggressor and say, I'm okay, you're not okay. But the more natural state is, I'm not okay, you're okay. At the age of three, it's, I'm okay, you're okay. See, this is like a function place. This, this, is, not, this is only used for functions, huh? mainly. Well, anything else here? This video is going to cut out any minute. Um, greed doesn't work. Greed is manic. Greed is... This, greed is a lot of chemistry involved with it. It's an addictive quality. They've made an idol out of the item, not realizing that the item is an unconscious symbol for the breast, and they don't, they don't think that way. They don't understand metaphor. Insatiable, repetition, compulsion, endless, timeless. Now the envy part of it that's underneath it is doesn't want to see goodness. So greed has taken all the goodness. It doesn't work. That satisfies the, the traumatic attempt to heal. Pos so greed is actually a, has a positive side to it. It's attempting in the deluded fantasy to heal the trauma. It doesn't work. But infused in it is the underlying greed that says, well, they don't want to see goodness. So they take in the goodness and the attempt to heal. It doesn't work. Uh, the greed is the deeper issue of, uh, I don't want to be reminded of goodness. So they want to see things damaged. Huh? So that's why that plunder guy, that billionaire, he said it. Dear people, I'm 99 years old. I want to leave you with something. I'm going to give you a crumb here. I want you to think good about me. It's all about envy, not greed. Greed is just a, like a vehicle for the envy. Greed is the Trojan horse for envy. How's that? Does that work? Greed is the, so greed is wonderful. It's a gift. It's a Trojan horse. Underneath is the envy. Is that right? That doesn't fit too well, does it? Scratch that one. What, what kind of analogy or metaphor can we use to convey the idea 
that um, greed has a destructive quality. And that's the covert mission of greed, to satisfy the envy. So there are two motives. In other words, there are two motives. The organisms drive to heal through the repetition compulsion, hence the greed. The underlying deeper feeling that it's not going to work and the rage is always there, the en and rage leads to the envy, they don't want to see the goodness. Now they, so while the greed is damaging, the envy part is saying, good, it's being destroyed. So the world is run by envy. The, the covert uh, puppet master is the envy. Greed, greed is just the puppet. Does that work? Envy is the... Um, envy is the, the handler and greed is the puppet. That doesn't work. I can't think of a good analogy. We'll have to come up with one here. Oh my God, let me, let me have a seat here. Yesterday, I did a whole video right here for three hours. Can you believe it? I got to sit here yesterday for three hours. What a delight. And it wasn't a bad video. My, yesterday's video was okay. It was pretty good, right? Done right here. It's very spot, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting sentimental over places. Because I bounce around constantly looking for places to do my videos. Um, this, this, I gotta admit, uh, this place has been the coolest place, yeah. Yeah, the attitude here is, uh, it's, it's, good, it's good here. Massive popular complex, two towers, um, a lot of functions here. But the other hotels have also been helpful. So all of my videos uh, for the past four, four and a half months, oh, isn't that ironic? Four and a half months. That's when the baby hatches out of the egg between four and five months. Anyway, it's a coincidence. So all of them, they were done in these three hotels. This one, at different spots. And in the other two, there were, all, there were also different spots. Uh, uh, with the one exception, the, the red brick one, that was done in a fourth hotel. And I did two videos in a coffee shop. That didn't work, so I couldn't do it out in an outdoor place. Well, any final thoughts? So the handbag the lady buys, that's not the breast. It's psychotic to think so. The seduction is, when you buy something, you get serotonin. So that's why, oh, it's good to have this extra thing. I might need it. And you make some excuse. Well, on, on Thursdays, I'd like to have a different, I'd like to have a different purse to match my dress for on th whatever it is, I don't know. Now think about it, the guy's 99 years old and he's still plundering. Plundering is filled with immense envy and hate because by it, by the plundering, 30,000 perish a day, billions in poverty. Uh, the food supply is being damaged, nature's being damaged, the ecology, the ecosystem is being damaged. It's just this blind compulsion to express the rage at the mother. Lloyd Damas says that religion is the phantom, about the phantom placenta. Imagine the, your placenta in the sky and you have a connection to it. So update that to the phantom breast. Religion doesn't make you conscious. Religion is not there to make you conscious. It's just there to, to engage in the repetition compulsion of the fantasy of still chasing it. Now it's seductive because when you're reminded of a connection to the placenta or the breast, you get a little hit of oxytocin or serotonin. The person says, I'm a believer, kind of thing. So for more on that, TQ 1203, one of our key quotes on our thread on religion, 